and welcome to a fascinating discussion that we uh, expect this afternoon uh, in our in wrapping up our series on ideas, interests, institutions, and nation state climate politics. We are talking today about two of the hard cases for climate policy, Australia and Brazil. Uh, and we are extremely fortunate to straddle time zones to the point that we have uh, Peter Kristoff, who is associate professor uh, at the School of Geography at the University of Melbourne, who uh, woke up to be with us at this early hour, 5.30 a.m. in Australia. And then, um, and we also have uh, Joana Castro Pereira, who's a researcher at the Portuguese Institute of International Relations, where it is 8.30 p.m. And we also, uh, just, just a, a short temporal jump away, we have uh, Eduardo Viola, who's a senior research fellow at the Institute of Advanced Studies at the University of Sao Paulo. So we are very pleased to have uh, very distinguished speakers. Um, I think I'm gonna turn the, um, the uh, space over to uh, Joanna and Eduardo, who are going to present uh, on the Brazilian case, and then we will ask uh, Peter Christoph to present for us about Australia. And then we will hopefully have some time for comments and questions and answers. We ask people who are interested in participating uh, in these questions and answers to please uh, submit questions in the Q&A area. Uh, the webinars will be recorded. And in fact, they will be available on YouTube within a few days. Uh, at the Center for Environmental Policy at the School of Public Affairs of American University, which is sponsoring this event. So thank you so much for joining us. And please, uh, Joanna and Eduardo, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. Thank you, Todd, for the kind invitation to be part of this project and to participate in this webinar. It is a pleasure for me and Eduardo to be here today with you. We have a PowerPoint presentation. I'm going to share my screen. Okay, here it is. I hope you can see it. So um, in our chapter, we look at the politics of climate change, neglect and denial in Brazil, arguing that the country has been neither a mitigator nor an adapter. We start by providing an overview of Brazil's contribution and vulnerability to climate change. Brazil accounts for over 3% of global emissions. The forest and land use sector currently represent almost half of Brazilian gross emissions. And Amazonian deforestation accounts for approximately 80% of the sector's total emissions. The evolution of the land use, land use change, and forestry sector, particularly in the Amazon, is key to the understanding of the political economy of climate change in the country. Since the early 1990s, the sector has accounted for approximately 75% to 25% of Brazilian total emissions. Brazil is not only a major greenhouse gas emitter. It is also a highly vulnerable country to the impacts of climate change, which threaten the country's socioeconomic development and place significant pressure on vulnerable groups and ecosystems. It should be noted that a strong deforestation control policy launched in the second half of the 2000s, including command and control strategies, private agreements, agriculture intensification, among others, uh, had transformed Brazil into a climate change mitigator. However, the trajectory of Brazilian emissions has been reversed since 2013. And in our chapter, we identify the factors that have precluded the country from consolidating the climate friendly position it had started to build during the previous years. And we also look at Brazil's climate change adaptation plan which was adopted in 2016, and we shed light on the reasons why it has been only marginally implemented. From 2011, 
environmental progress was halted and partially rolled back and climate governance weakened in Brazil. The 2011 to 2018 period in Brazil was one of climate neglect. President Dilma Rousseff prioritized short-term economic growth considerations and the Ministry of Environment resigned itself to the vision and orientation followed by the new administration. In 2011, the ministry even supported a reform to the Brazilian Forest Code that largely reduced environmental protections and which was promoted by the powerful agribusiness lobby in Congress. Additionally, public and political attention to environmental issues declined dramatically given domestic turmoil, which also reinforced the power of the agribusiness lobby. At the same time, um, the worsening of Brazil's fiscal situation led to significant reductions in financial support for critical environmental supervisory agencies working in the Amazon. Since 2016, the political power of the agribusiness lobby consolidated. The process of impeachment of Rousseff was an opportunity for the lobby to further advance its anti-environmentalist agenda. In fact, half of the votes against Rousseff came from the Agribusiness Caucus in Congress. Rousseff's su successor, Michel Temer, depended on the Agribusiness Caucus to pass his legislative agenda and avoid trial and impeachment, and took, in exchange for political support, major measures against the Amazon. These actions, alongside further, further cuts in environmental spending as part of the Temer administration's drastic fiscal deficit control policy, continue to boost deforestation. Despite re regression in climate change mitigation policy, this period saw the emergence of the adaptation policy agenda in Brazil. And this was mainly the result of more frequent and severe floods and droughts during Rousseff's presidency, alongside um, the rise of the adaptation agenda in global climate policy. From 2013 to 2016, an intersectoral working group designed the Brazilian National Adaptation Plan. But um, having been designed during a period of climate policy reversal, the plan followed a non-binding and mainly informative approach. Sector-based priorities prevailed, which affected the plan's overall coherence and ambition. The weakened Ministry of Environment was able to exert only minimal influence upon other sector-based agendas and their tools. The plan was designed by several institutional actors with different understandings of the country's vulnerabilities adaptation needs, uh, development priorities, and who frame the issue in ways that advance their interpretation of the preferred policy instruments and practices, which were in most cases integrated into existing policies. The sectoral adaptation strategies were conceived according to um, distinct or even divergent concept, concepts of uh, adaptation. The plan contains only general guidelines for action and financial constraints, which were aggravated by governmental prioritization of mitigation over adaptation, hindered implementation. The plan's main accomplishment during this period was essentially um, consisted essentially of diagnosing the problem. Uh, 2019 marked the beginning of a new phase a phase characterized by climate change skepticism and a clear rejection of environmental sustainability imperatives by the administration of Jair Bolsonaro, which aligned with the US Donald Trump administration. The Bolsonaro administration uh, launched an aggressive assault against environmental policy and institutions, which severely affected the Amazon. The deep and openly anti-environmentalist climate skeptical orientation of Bolsonaro's government mirrored the formation of its strategic core with a group of radical market-friendly ministries displaying an anti-conservationist vision of development, a minister of environment very close to the agribusiness lobby, 
a minister of foreign affairs who publicly denied the anthropogenic character of climate change and believed in conspiracy theories and a group of military-led ministries willing to deepen the state's control over the Amazon through the development of extractivist projects and the construction of new infrastructure in the region. The fact that public and media attention was focused on the COVID-19 health crisis allowed the government to advance its anti-environmentalist agenda. In fact, almost half of the measures weakening environmental legislation under the Bolsonaro administration were signed during the first months of the pandemic. Environmental management bodies and supervisory procedures were militarized and the participatory rights of civil society limited and fines for um, environmental crimes dropped sharply. In 2020, amid the government's disastrous response to the pandemic health crisis and calls for presidential impeachment, Bolsonaro aligned with the so-called Centrão in Congress, which is a group of deputies, including many members of the agribusiness lobby, willing to support the government in office in exchange for political favors. So in early 2021, the Centrão uh, gained control of the Chamber of Deputies and a bill abolishing environmental licensing and another one legalizing the occupation of public lands and amnestying land grabbers were approved. However, from 2021, the government has displayed a more environment friendly rhetoric as a result of at least five factors. First, internal criticism of Bolsonaro's policies. Second, growing European opposition to ratification of the trade deal with Mercosur. Third, manifest concern by international investors. Fourth, awareness that Amazonian forests could provide a very significant number of credits for carbon offsetting and benefit the business sector's economic interests. And fifth, Trump's defeat in the US presidential elections of 2020, which prompted the resignation of the climate skeptic Minister of Foreign Affairs and empowered Brazil's pro-environmental forces. Several sectors of Brazilian society have displayed a more pro-environmental position. For example, the Brazilian Coalition on Climate, Forests and Agriculture, which is formed by organizations in the agribusiness sector, NGOs, academics and companies, has grown and has become more active, strongly advocating for an Amazonian deforestation control policy. Regarding adaptation against the background of climate skepticism and later climate opportunism, and severe cuts in environmental and science spending, the adaptation policy agenda was unsurprisingly practically stagnant. Intersectoral work and concrete action were marginal, with um, activities initiated over the previous years being, in many cases, discontinued. After analyzing Brazilian climate change politics and policies of the past decade, and in light of Amazonian deforestation's major contribution to Brazilian emissions, the high vulnerability to climate change of the forest and its populations, and also the critical importance of the biome's biodiversity for planetary life on Earth, we then zoom into the Amazon to discuss climate change mitigation and adaptation strategies in and for the region. And in this section of the chapter, we draw attention to the fact that policies and climate related initiatives for the Amazon in Brazil have focused on mitigation. And we demonstrate how mitigating and adapting to climate change in the region depends on the adoption of sustainable development. We identify a number of policies, which you can see in this slide, uh, that could be implemented in the region to ensure both mitigation and adaptation to climate change. Mitigation strategies that move beyond a sole focus on reducing emissions and increasing carbon removals from the atmosphere 
and which are implemented alongside social measures, benefit community adaptation and well-being. In the Amazon in particular, land grabbing and speculation and the concentration of land ownership alongside the historical marginalization of smallholder family farming generate an increasing demand for clearing forests. And curbing land grabbing requires not only strong monitoring and law enforcement actions, but also land tenure, security, and protection for indigenous peoples, and the designation of public forests to clarify tenure and limit the amount of land available for the expansion of agriculture and ranching. Indigenous peoples and their lands have been under attack in Brazil. Territorial encroachment from illegal actors has become more frequent and uh, dangerous. And this is a threat to both Amazonian carbon stocks and indigenous communities' capacity to adapt to climate change. In addition, it should be noted that nearly one fourth of deforestation in the Brazilian Amazon in recent years has taken place in undesignated lands. And there is mounting scientific evidence of the important role played by indigenous peoples and other local communities as um, guardians of the forest. Secure and protected land managed by those communities usually display low levels of deforestation and forest degradation, and their conservation efforts are overall more effective and less costly than conventional government-led alternatives. So designating public forests to sustainable community use and securing land tenure could reduce illegal deforestation and limit the market for land grabbing and speculation. It could also generate income opportunities for local populations and um, increase their adaptive capacities. Another important aspect is that while command and control strategies, private agreements, uh, or agriculture intensification played a key role in deforestation and emissions reduction in the 2000s in Brazil, forest loss by deforestation remained um, high among vulnerable populations. The frontier areas where deforestation has persisted are characterized by socioeconomic precariousness. In many cases, Policies for sustainable land use have not reached the most vulnerable populations. And this is particularly visible in the case of smallholder family farmers who occupy large areas of the Amazon. Lacking technical assistance, know-how or uh, resources, they rely on farming practices that deplete soil nutrients, which results in low crop productivity and insufficient income and encourages more deforestation. Therefore, promoting economic, social, and environmental improvements through assistance to smallholder family farmers should be part of a portfolio of mitigation and adaptation policies for the Amazon. Another critical aspect to consider is that forest degradation is a significant source of emissions. But this problem uh, is not directly addressed by deforestation control policies. Emissions associated with forest fires and edge effects continue to increase, even when significant reductions in deforestation were uh, in deforestation emissions were occurring. Simultaneously, forest degradation is now the main cause of social environmental impoverishment in the Amazon. There currently is more degraded than deforested land in um, the region. Against this background, ensuring the provision of forest ecosystem services requires restoration. This can significantly increase carbon uptake and provide multiple ecological and social economic benefits, including connectivity of the remaining forest patches, a greater flow of ecosystem goods and uh, services, and the development or development opportunities for uh, local communities. Command and control policies alone have proven insufficient to promote the restoration needed to connect forest landscapes or ensure that ecosystems provide the services required for local well being and development. So, restoration is crucial for sustainable rural development and to achieve the mitigation and adaptation goals of the Paris Agreement. Furthermore, protection for secondary forests is needed. 
These forests play an important role in the fight against climate change and biodiversity loss. Um, also in the restoration of ecosystems and the promotion of sustainable livelihoods. Protected areas in the Amazon arc of deforestation also warrant attention given their low resilience status. This should be targeted for interventions to improve ecological connectivity. And projects to restore, maintain, or increase ecological connectivity in forests can simultaneously promote local socioeconomic development. Agroforestry is a good example of a practice that can be implemented to improve ecological connectivity and promote both mitigation and adaptation for forests and people. In addition to removing and storing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and protecting biodiversity, agroforestry also provides sustainable livelihoods for small farmers, maintains soil fertility and increases uh, food security. Lands that are managed sustainably can act as buffers that protect biodiversity hotspots and connect forest habitats, thereby increasing forest resilience and the production of goods. In sum, fighting inequalities and poverty in the region is an essential condition for reaching zero deforestation and enabling the adaptation of both forests and people to climate change. However, even if insufficient and reversed in recent years, policies and climate-related initiatives for the Amazon in Brazil have focused on reducing emissions from deforestation and therefore on uh, mitigation. A change of government is a necessary condition for the implementation of better policies. However, the effective protection of the Amazon, its populations and the global climate depends on the Brazilian state's capacity to overcome path dependencies and uh, power structures rooted in the country's extractivist history. We conclude uh, the chapter by briefly looking at the future of climate change policy in Brazil in light of prospects for this year's general elections about which Eduardo will now talk about. Thank you very much, Joanna. <clears throat> it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, so I will try to complement some of, of the issues that were uh, raised by uh, Joanna. First one that is very important to consider is the complexity of the agribusiness Brazilian sector. Uh, generally outside Brazil, there is a general idea that the whole agribusiness is very conservative and pro anti environment That is, that was never true in the last 10 years, but particularly is not true right now. Uh, the, there is, today we can divide in the Brazilian agribusiness three major sectors. In the agribusiness, because it is also the family agriculture. You, uh, Joanna, you can take out the, 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 this uh, slide, please. Uh, so, the, the, um, um, the, the, uh, the first sector of the agribusiness that has been growing significantly in the last years is the sector that is uh, has internalized climate change and is advanced uh, cutting edge in terms of technology. So it's technologically advanced and environmentally advanced. This sector has been growing constantly in the last years and is close to become uh, very important. The second sector that is uh, the, the economically the more powerful I would say, is the sector that is technologically advanced, but is, has not internalized environmental protection and climate mitigation. The third sector is the sector that is backward, uh, is not, uh, is backward technologically and environmentally. In the Amazon, the sector that prevails almost completely is the third, the third sector, okay? Uh, but in the rest of the country, it varies a lot. 
This is the, uh, the first point that I would like to, to take about. Uh, um, the, the second point is about the difference between the House of Representatives and the Senate. The House of Representatives, Representatives is more conservative than the Senate, generally in, in most issues, and particularly in environmental and climate issues. For example, uh, there are the three most uh, 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 law, the, the three most anti-environment bills that were approved in 2000, in 2020 and 2021 in the House are uh, has not been treated in the Senate. Why? Because the, the the leaders of the Senate say these laws should not be approved. Okay, uh, so. The second point I would like to say is, to, is a very fast uh, comparison between Brazil, the US, and Australia, three continental countries, uh, two of them very highly, highly populated, Brazil and United States, the other one, no, Australia. And I, it's interesting to follow. Uh, the three are very hard uh, cases, but in a different way. Right? In my, uh, in my under, for example, the United States has recently has a very uh, a long history of building up environmental institutions. Okay, and when there is uh, uh, the whole attempt of reverse climate policies by the Trump administration, a lot of this reverse was. Uh, stopped somehow, not completely, but by the, 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 the power of the institution. In the case of Brazil, we had a, in a period that goes from 2004 to 2012, a dramatic decline in emissions because dramatic decline in deforestation, as Joanna was saying. So this is something that is unique in the history of Latin America and in the, even in the history of the world, okay? Um, and uh, afterwards, there was a, a significant reverse, not complete reverse. And why? Because the, uh, uh, compared with the United States, because environmental institutions are not as strong and uh, uh, internalized in the system of governments of Brazil, like compared with the United States. And it's interesting also to compare Brazil with the rest of Latin America. As you know, except Mexico, uh, all Latin American countries has a significant uh, 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 source of emissions in, in deforestation, okay? Uh, but, um, there are the trajectories, most of the countries have not had any successful policy in controlling deforestation. There has been, there have been two countries that have had successful policies in, control, uh, in, in, in land, land use change. First of all, Costa Rica in the late 80s, early 90s, that has been uh, consolidated. Uh, the second one is Chile, okay, that in the last decade, in, in the in the 20s decade already, they have been very uh, consistent in managing soils. And for that reason, Brazil, uh, Chile is today, uh, has uh, sequestered more carbon uh, from soil than emits, okay? That is a major achievement and from this point of view, is similar to the United States or even today, China, for example, okay? And uh, we have also Uruguay that has never been a significant deforester. To the contrary, has been a forester uh, or reforester country, but uh, it's a very small country. Okay, and I think my Peter will talk about this. But uh, my feeling is that Australia is a case similar somehow to the rest of Latin America, it's different from Brazil, Costa Rica, Chile, and Uruguay. That. Uh, it has never had a significant climate policy, okay? Uh, but of course, in the case of Australia, the issue is not deforestation, it's energy, okay? But uh, the, this, this is interesting to, to consider. And so the, uh, the other, very, very fast, uh, 
The other thing that is important to consider, why was this dramatic decline in deforestation between 2004 and 2012, is because of several drivers. The, third, the, the several, but important, but the, probably the most important is the presence of, uh, of uh, an environmental and Amazonian leadership in the Minister of the Environment, Marina C. The second very important is that the president, Lula da Silva, was sensitive to the pressure from Marina Silva and the environmental community for implementing the policy. Uh, the, the pressures of NG Brazilian and global NGOs was very important also, the, 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 and the pressure of the European governments and European NGOs, generally speaking, including consumers and European supermarkets. All this created a very, very interesting, positive situation, okay, in which uh, we have a really very amazing declining in deforestation, okay? Despite the, the, the forces in favor of deforestation were very powerful. Okay, okay. Uh, what about the future? We have basically today two possibilities. One is uh, uh, the re-election of Bolsonaro that would imply the continuation of the the a policy that as was uh, uh, this, this described by by Joana, uh, that is anti-environment, anti-climate, either adaptation or mitigation, uh, and uh, maybe with some uh, moderation in the in a second term. Okay, uh, because of the depending on the international dynamic. For example, um, moderation with Biden president. But if a Republican and the environment, Trump or other, comes back to the president in 2024, probably there will be a new radicalization and the environment. Okay. Uh, so and the other is Lula da Silva. Okay, that has been already president, and during his president, there was this major achievement in deforestation policies. Okay, not generally in uh, um, decarbonization policy, because in the area of energy, there was not progress. To the contrary, there was a in some increase in carbonization in the uh, electricity matrix and also in the in the energy matrix generally speaking because of the subsidies to to gasoline and uh, and this okay uh, and so the the from this the likely the more probably uh, today um, like probably uh, Lula will win the election, but almost certain there will be a coup attempt by Bolsonaro. Okay, so it's and the the, the situation could become very turbulent. Okay, uh, for that reason, it's very important that the Biden administration is giving clear signals to the Brazilian elites that the. The, the, there is uh, unacceptable any questioning of the ele election result. Okay, uh, and so um, somehow the uh, the implementation uh, we can't think that during a new Lula administration uh, we will have a significant progress in in the forestation control in the Amazon. Okay. Uh, because he's, he has already done this, but the conditions are different. One more negative, organized crime is much more powerful today in the Amazon than it was 15 years ago. The other more positive, that is the fact of climate change has a much more, uh, has much more uh, uh, visibility and relevance in the global arena today. Okay, so uh, the, the, from this point of view, we can say that a Lula administration policy could be uh, better in terms of deforestation, much better, probably promoting 
more growing of the more progressive sectors of the agribusiness and promoting transformation in the production of the family agriculture. Okay, uh, and, and generally speaking, having developed a program for um, uh, forestation, reforestation, and carbon sequestration in large scale. The difficulties or the constraints are from the side that Brazilian fiscal crisis crisis is very severe. From a point of view of energy, the uh, the situation is not very positive. Why? Because Lula is strongly linked to the uh, Petrobras, eh? the. Uh, uh, the state-owned corporation that is almost a monopoly, mon a monopoly in, in Brazil, and uh, also string, uh, strongly linked to the union of the Petrobras, the trade unions in Petrobras, and the trade union, unions in the automobile industry that are reluctant to support the uh, moving away from uh, internal combustion uh, engine in the automobile industry to the electric vehicle. Okay, so because they think they uh, rob there will be a dramatic robotization of the production and, and a dramatic unemployment. Okay, so in the area of energy, uh, the situation uh, looks not not very positive. Though there is a market dynamic that will continues. Uh, uh, there will be a continuous continuity in expansion of the wind power and solar power. Okay, uh, so the the this is and and also there is a new dynamic, uh, very recent, that is the investment of German corporations uh, in the production of green hydrogen. Uh, Brazil and Chile are the countries that have been chosen by the. But German government and the, the German corporations. Okay, so Chile is much more advanced than Brazil. Is a uh, is a wind in the Patagonia in the south and solar in the north. And uh, well, I, I I will finish here because I, otherwise I will take a lot of time. Thank you very much. Excellent. Thank you very much to both of you for a very. Uh, comprehensive discussion. And I think that we we have Peter Christoph who will probably add to the the issue that uh, Joanna raised about the uh, the history of extractivism and the difficulty of separating uh, from the extractivist past, which indeed and the the comparisons that that Eduardo made of of you know three countries with with some strong uh, moments of anti-climate policies, which I think link the countries. Anyway, without further ado, I would turn it over to uh, Professor Christoph. And um, and do you need some help getting up the slides? Thanks very much, Todd. And um, hello to everyone. It's a miserable hour in the morning here, but I'm hoping you're having a lovely afternoon where you are. Uh, we had a little problem with screen sharing before. I'm going to try and share my screen. And then if that fails, Todd, I will ask you to intervene and see how we go. This looks like it might be a little more possible. Let me just see. Any success? Yes. Oh, excellent. thank you. Fantastic. All right. That's thank you very much. Look, this presentation really does follow on quite beautifully from the one we've just heard. And, and thanks to Joana and Eduardo for a terrific coverage of the Brazilian condition. Um, what I'm going to try and do is to race through far too many slides, as is usually the case for me, to try and address what I think is two puzzles, which are similar to the Brazilian ones, but, but also quite different, of course, because in as Australia is a developed country, it has many more opportunities, at least in terms of its economic capacity, to do a range of things which have confronted it ever since the climate problem emerged 30 or more years ago. Really, there are two puzzles, I think. Firstly, as an overall characterization, I would suggest that Australia is a reluctant mitigator and a reluctant adapter. And the puzzles are these. Firstly, in terms of mitigation, Australia is definitely a country which suffers the fossil fuel curse. As I'll explain, it has overwhelming uh, fossil fuel resources. 
So the question here then is, why is it actually a mitigator under those circumstances, given the um, capacity for it to rely on very cheap and very substantial fossil fuel resources? In terms of adaptation, the puzzle here is that given Australia is an extraordinarily vulnerable continent in terms of climate impacts and climate catastrophes, and I don't have to, I'm sure, tell you about the fires and the floods that we've been having in particular with enormous, with extraordinary severity over the last um, three or four years. Why it is that in the face of those extraordinary catastrophic impacts, Australia has been such a reluctant adapter? Okay, so then let me move on and I'm going to try and provide at least a little bit of a, an answer to those questions. But I want to just start off with a quick comment about the methodological problems of doing this. Um, as we all know, when you're looking at climate policy, you end up with this extraordinary plethora, this kaleidoscopic set of factors. It's, it's a multifactorial puzzle, analyzing what happens in any country's um, policy areas, particularly climate and energy. When you look at um, climate and energy policy drivers, this is the sort of thing that I find myself having to look at it. And I've tried to break the factors into a number of different clusters. Domestically, there are material circumstances, the underlying conditions which one finds, economic factors, the domestic political economy of a country in place, its political and legal institutions, actors and their ideas and discourses, and then the domestic effects of nature. Internationally, as we know, there are a range of international political and economic pressures, including normative ones which derive from international institutions like the IPCC, like the Framework Convention on Climate Change. And then lastly, there are global factors, in other words, the driving force of the climate catastrophe as it's conceived of as a global condition. Now, when you look at these drivers, in a sense, depending on which you want to emphasise, you end up with somewhat different narratives of what's happening in a particular place or country. And this is, the, in, in a sense, the methodological puzzle which I face trying to understand the Australian condition. In my particular approach, I've emphasised, as this list suggests, firstly, the material circumstances, the underlying condition of Australia, then economic factors, and I'll explain why I've, I've done this as I go through my analysis. And then I turn to political, legal institutions, actors, and the other factors that I've described here. So let me begin by perhaps giving you a little bit of an outline of the specific circumstance, the material circumstances, which I think have framed Australian climate and energy policy so powerfully for the last 30 years, and how they might be changing. Firstly, in terms of Australian energy, fuel energy production, as I mentioned, Australia is extraordinarily um, get blessed or cursed with an abundance of fossil fuels, which have been exploited both for domestic and also for international for export markets with increasing ferocity over the last 30 or 40 years and with a particular surge that's occurred since the start of the century, a particularly um, grim irony, if you like, given what we're trying to do uh, both within Australia and also globally. In terms of, ex in terms of energy production, the substantial um, volume of energy production, particularly coal, but also now gas, has been oriented in oriented to export markets. In other words, two, about two thirds of Australia's energy production is now exported. One third, a relatively stable quota at, at this point in time, is domestic in its orientation. And here you can see the, the extraordinary acceleration that has occurred in particular, if you look at the period from the start of this century onwards, in terms of the increased mining of coal, thermal and metallurgical coal, uh, in particular for the Japanese, the South Korean, and now increasingly um, Chinese markets, and also the very substantial increase that's occurred in the extraction of liquid and nat liquid natural gas. The importance of this in terms of the Australian narrative is this, it leaves Australia as the world's largest coal exporter, and the world's largest LNG, liquid natural gas exporter. In terms of its overall carbon footprint, domestic emissions and also the embodied emissions of what it exports, Australia has a very significant role to play in terms of global warming. It's the world's fifth or sixth largest emitter in terms of the total carbon production uh, it engages in. Um, it's as I mentioned, the, the production is, uh, is um, predominantly export oriented 
and very importantly for the narrative, but also for the economic consequences for Australia, coal and gas are Australia's biggest source of export income, about a third of total export income with some fluctuations there. More importantly, I suppose, in terms of the narrative that has developed in Australia, there is a popular belief that we are highly dependent on coal and gas exports. It's not the case. Um, export, in, export income is not the total sum of Australia's GDP. So it, it provides about somewhere between 5 to 8% of gross domestic product. In terms of employment, there's a belief that it's a, this, the fossil fuel sector is a very major in, uh, a very major component of total employment. Again, that's not the case. But the pop popular imagination and narrative has magnified the importance of our role in this space in a way that makes it a very uh, significant political impediment to change. Domestically, what we found is that there have been changes over time, and these are accelerating, as I'll explain, in terms of our dependence on fossil fuels. The rise of renewables is relatively slow. This, this chart is a, a broad indication that we are still significantly dependent on black coal and brown coal for um, the production of fossil fuels, about 80% overall, and gas as well. Um, but there is a shift that is beginning to occur domestically, in particular because in the domestic energy market, the relative costs of renewable energy as opposed to fossil fuel energy has now shifted. Renewables, and this is a, this is a I'm, I'm afraid I couldn't find a comparative diagram which is more recent than this, it's even more favourable now, solar um, and offshore wind are now far more economically um, viable investment propositions and propositions in terms of the cost of energy that they produce than coal or gas. So in the Australian context, there will never be another coal-fired power, coal -fired power plant built domestically, and it's highly unlikely that gas plants will also be built. So the, the idea of a gas-based transition in the Australian economy is no longer one which most people, despite some politicians, take seriously, certainly not in terms of the private sector, which was um, the investment driver in the uh, domestic energy market. Okay, what does this mean in terms of our total emissions by sector? And here the comparison with Brazil, of course, is quite stark. Our predominant um, source of emissions is electricity, uh, electricity production, then stationary electricity, uh, stationary energy, ele excluding electricity, transport. So about 55, 60% of total emissions comes from the energy sector plus transport. Agriculture is important, and then we have um, drawdown effects in terms of reforestation of a landscape, which was very significantly cleared during colonisation and the 20th century, which have counterbalanced some of these emissions effects over time. This is what the profile looks like over the period from 1990 through to the present. And as you can see, Australian emissions continued to rise until 2006, 2007. Um, with almost without abate, well, without abatement in terms of the production of emissions from um, energy production, from electricity production, and with a strong reliance on drawdown from the land use and land use clearing factors, which as a component, as a contributor, now has diminished. We're finding now that it's, it's, since 2005, Australian emissions overall have declined by about 20%, largely in the absence of national uh, mitigation policy. I will, I'll come back to this and stress it um, in a variety of different ways in a moment. So that's the overall view of the materiality, if you like, of the Australian um, um, energy and climate sector. In terms of our league, political and legal institutions, Australia, as you probably well know, is the federal federated state, national government plus eight states and territories. And these are divided into those which are fossil fuel oriented. So Western Australia, um, major producer of nat natural gas for export, Queensland, and New South Wales, major producers of coal for export, and then modern fossil fuel states. So there's a division within the country between states, which begins to play out politically. Constitutionally, national government has treaty and trade power. So it's a national government which could shut down all exports, for example, and fossil fuels overnight if it chose to do so. The states have the powers to govern and, and develop energy and other forms of infrastructure which will affect the way in which we progress in terms of mitigation. 
there's real problems of harmonisation and contest between these levels of government, national government and states and territories. Usually the national government is politically oriented in one direction, states and territories in another. And I have to say, it's a bit of a shame that we're having this seminar today rather than a week's time, because we're going to have an election this Saturday, which may significantly change the character and orientation of a lot of what I'm talking about if we actually manage to pick up a progressive, in other words, social democrat Labor government, either in um, a minority government or an absolute majority, or whether we stick with our current conservative coalition government. We have a two-level parliamentary system, uh, um, similar to the uh, United States in some ways, but much more like the UK and Canada in its uh, origins and in terms of its performance, with blocking occurring in the Senate, uh, and different, much more directly represented in the Senate. A two-party preferred voting system, which confuses most people, compulsory voting and preference distribution. So predominantly it's a contest between one, a coalition of conservative parties, the Liberal Party and the National Party. And on the other hand, the Labor Party, sometimes with the Greens and independents, as we'll see. And a highly adversarial political culture, unlike the sort of corporatist or consensual political cultures that you find in many European countries, in Australia, like in Britain, like in the United States, it is a brutal clash between ideological views and parties. And this is the way in which politics is conducted in Australia, to the great detriment of the development of policies of great national unity, with the exception of um, foreign policy and defence policy. Lastly, and just in terms of institutions, this, this frame makes it very easy for one or two or three individual seats out of 150 in the lower house in which forms government to actually determine policy. If there's a close election has occurred in 2019, then the outcomes in these coal seats, the ones where coal miners and their jobs are predominant matters of concern, can shape government and quite radically distort policy irrespective of what national public opinion might, might choose um, to emphasise. So the picture so far is that we have a multi-level climate and energy politics in Australia. We have it divided horizontally between states and territories and also vertically between national government and, and subnational governments, according to fossil fuel and non-fossil fuel factors, domestic and export factors. The transition that's occurring, and there is a transition that's occurring, is powerfully influenced by changing costs of renewables rather than policy at the national level. And the export economy is powerfully driven by international forces. It's almost a two-stage or a parallel set of economies that we're talking about here. So we end up with contradictory energy and climate policies and political cultures across the country. In terms of key actors, we have the, the governments, that the, the parties that I mentioned, also a very significant block of lobby groups in the mineral sector, fossil fuel sector, and the unions associated with them, which have been very powerful in driving policy, irrespective of which party is in government. And that's partly because of the structure, the, the nature of the political institutions that we deal with. We're also seeing, however, the emergence of a counter block, if you like, associated with private electricity generation based on renewables, solar and wind, which are becoming increasingly prominent and popular in their uptake and their development. And then we, of course, we have the, the social society groupings, the environment and climate movement groups, farming and mining communities. The farming community is predominantly deeply opposed to the fossil fuel sector because it's its land is which is being dug up or affected by um, fossil fuel either coal or, or gas exploitation and the mining communities i've mentioned their their role and then an increasingly important non-resource sector block including banks insurance companies and superannuation companies which have substantial resources for investment and they're moving rapidly out of the fossil fuel sector and lastly and particularly in the context of uh, global media and, and the Murdoch press and the Murdoch media, we have media as a very significant force in Australia driving policy. If one was to focus on actors, then the narrative is a slightly different one from the one that I've just described, or, or it segues, the, the two sort of merge in very interesting ways. I think you can divide Australian climate and energy policy 
up into a number of different phases, which unsurprisingly also map over changes in government. First, Labor ALP is the Australian Labor Party. Labor governments have been relatively progressive in domestic policy and not at all interested in export uh, um, fossil fuels, except to boost and continue to development. The coalition, the conservative bloc, of course, has been a strong supporter of fossil fuels, both domestically and also in terms of its export orientation. And we've seen this oscillation that's occurred in the first couple of phases in the early days of the climate narrative. Um, there's been a relative naivety about the implications of transition in Australia and a real um, resistance by a very powerful block of um, lobbyists and negotiators, interest groups to stop any action policy at all. And that really prevails until about 2006, 2007, where you get the first Labor government under Kevin Rudd, which is strongly oriented towards transformation. And that was the narrative that brought Rudd to power. Climate has been a very significant force in changes of government. Um, and as I'll explain, changes of leadership as well. And then we've had this oscillation between progress, relatively progressive Labor governments, but still very cautious in terms of their policies and react, what I've called reactive fundamentalism, including a couple of prime ministers, Howard is one, Abbott is the other, conservative prime ministers who were explicit climate skeptics. And it's their skepticism or denialism in the case of Abbott, which is shaped and driven conservative politics. In the last period from about 2016 onwards, and again, we've had conservative governments through most of this period of time, the, that 30-year that period of time. In the last period from 2016 onwards, there's been this tension or trauma within the coalition, which has not enabled them to be as overtly uh, pro-fossil fuels as they used to be domestically, but has, because of internal divisions, paralyzed them in terms of positive uh, policy development. Interestingly, in the Australian context, and perhaps uniquely globally, we have seen a number of political leaders, prime ministers, deposed in office or in elections as a result of the climate issue. There's been an extraordinary political turbulence in the Australian context. Howard, and I'm going across the top, Howard, Kevin Rudd, Julia Gillard, Rudd takes his throne back again, um, Tony Abbott, Malcolm Turnbull and now Scott Morrison have all come to power because of big explosions either within their parties or between parties, positive, the progressives and the, the conservatives, over this period of time. This period between 1996 and 2018 has been called the climate wars because of its incredible political prominence and turbulence. So where has this left us? In terms of national climate policies, as I said, we have been an, a reluctant mitigator. Australia has the weakest of all major developed countries' targets in terms of a 2030 target, and no intention of budging, at least under the current coalition government. There's been an absence of strong domestic national climate mitigation policies and laws, attempts to try and put in place a climate price, um, and emissions reduction scheme, they've either failed to start or they've been knocked off. Public finance for mitigation has been very poor, very, uh, very um, minimal. The actual processes of reforming the national electricity production uh, grid and production overall has again been very slight and, and a whole range of policies have failed to start. There's no transition planning, which of course is quite important if you've got a very substantial national grid and you have private operators, and it's predominantly a private electricity um, production grid, where people, who, where companies that, that own fossil fuel-based um, electricity plants are simply dropping off as they realise that the economics of, of production is no longer in their favour. There's been unquestioned support by all of the major parties and subsidies for fossil fuel exports. And in terms of adaptation, there's been very little work done in terms of adaptation policy. It's been highly fragmented, issue by issue, crisis by crisis. And it's only very recently that we've actually got a national adaptation policy of any sort, with very little attention, however, to the problems of regional adaptation, which is going to, have to actually be a significant issue for Australia as our Asia-Pacific Asia regional um, neighbours 
run into even greater problems and crises than Australia is likely to face. So there's no attention really to the issue of climate displacement or as some people call it, climate uh, refugees. The contrast here is with subnational climate policies, where, as I mentioned, the unevenness between resource, energy resource, and non-energy resource, subnational states and territories, has led to a real differentiation and a really powerful forward momentum amongst the less dependent subnational states, which has then created a completely different context, including for national policy. Uneven domestic policies, therefore, at this level, some of the States have actually had emissions trading, substantial feeding tariffs of the German sort, substantial subnational targets, and significant adaptation policies and disaster funding. So this differentiation between levels of government is very important. And I'll just skip over this target, just show this, this slide. It shows that they're across the country now, all of the states and territories have got 2050 net zero emissions uh, outcomes or, or, or ambitions in some cases legislated, in some cases supported by very substantial transitional programs for mitigation. So all of the action is occurring at the subnational level, I would argue. Um, in terms of transition, the displacement of coal by competitive renewals is an economic force. It's been market force driven. Old, pants, old fossil fuel plants are being retired ad hoc. Ad hoc. There's no new, invest, new investment in coal uh, or gas decline in coal-fired power generation capacity overall. Um, this has been unplanned, poorly coordinated, lack of sequencing. There's a real problem, potentially, of energy security and blackouts occurring in parts of the country because of how poorly this has been uh, allowed to occur, lack of coordination. There's also the issue of what's going to happen in terms of the transport fleet. So policy really has not worked well. Even if we have a driving force at the subnational level, coordination nationally is really poor indeed. In terms of the, now let me quickly sort of move to a conclusion, in terms of international factors, as I mentioned, Australia is highly um, significant in terms of the global production of fossil fuels. Here again, though, Australia is going to face some very interesting problems. Neither of the major parties, as I said, wants to go anywhere near the export fossil fuel problem, but with changes in international markets, with China potentially moving away from fossil fuels, um, with the uh, geopolitical turbulence, which has now emerged in the energy markets for gas in particular, with the Ukrainian-Russian war, there are all sorts of factors which could either shut off or prolong Australian fossil fuel export industries, this parallel problem. And lastly, in terms of factors, there is the issue of nature. The analysis of Australia's likely future as the world warms, even if we hit only 1.5, which is already extremely dangerous, or two, which is diabolical, especially for countries like Australia, two degrees of global average warming, we will see significant increases in domestic um, continental temperature, sea, sea level rise. Australia is very much a coastal country, extreme rainfall effects and floods, extraordinary harsh fire weather as of the sort that we've seen in the last few years. And all of these disasters will occur with greater intensity, greater frequency and greater extension. Unsurprisingly, people are starting to cotton onto this and public opinion in Australia has shifted um, again in, in paradoxical ways from a high level of concern and attention in 2006, this starts then, which was at the end of a period of a 10 year drought of the sort that Australia had not seen in historical times, an extraordinary drought uh, in terms of its impacts on Australian agriculture period of decline and, and the rise and predominance of other concerns moving through uh, from about 2009 to about 2015. And now again, we're seeing this acceleration of concern and attention to climate change as a problem for Australians in general. This hasn't directly translated into a political set of outcomes though, for the reasons that I mentioned, because of the peculiarities of the Australian federal system and the ways in which um, politics works on the ground in this country. So to summarise, how do we see Australia or how do I see Australia in this sort of context? Is it a leader? Is it a follower? Is it a laggard? 
internationally, I think it's been a belligerent individualist. And if you've been following Australia's role in the international negotiations from Kyoto onwards, Australia took this radical, selfish, realist position in, 2000, in, in 1997, which gave it extraordinary targets enabling it to increase its emissions. Only Norway and, and, and I think Iceland went down a comparable path for other reasons. But for Australia, this was a major boost for the continuation and development of its fossil fuel sector. It's been a policy taker, not a policy maker. If there have been policy inter, in, innovations, they've been derived from the Europeans or perhaps sometimes from the United States in good and bad ways. So Trump's rise to power gave great courage and encouragement to Australian politicians who wanted to go down a similar path, both in terms of their international climate, political profile and behaviour, but also domestically. Domestically, dramatic policy oscillations. I've mentioned the phases. The transition has been driven by economic forces rather than by actors and by policy development at the national level, but it's been much more volitional at the subnational level. As a result, in, in, uh, in summary, Australia's had poorly embedded domestic policy processes in terms of mitigation, it's been encumbered by these electoral institutions and media and industry actors that have been able to diminish, delay, disable longer term policy development, unlike most European countries, by contrast, very weak processes for dealing with adaptation, disaster relief, though these are now starting to change, and, and interestingly, growing public hostility to this inaction. So, if the question is which factors and drivers predominate in Australian policy, do they predominate uniformly over time and geographically? What governs the shifts between factors and we're experiencing a shift now? I say that the factors which have predominated over the last 30 years have predominantly been economic and market forces, which have been not really under the control of uh, policymakers. They've gone along with the advantages that that has delivered, very sort of realist approach. Have they predominated uniformly over time? No, they haven't. I think there have been shifts both geographically um, and also temporally. And I think that the, again, changes in market forces and the relative influence of renew costs of renewables versus fossil fuels has begun to shift Australian conditions. But there are other factors that have come into play, significant capacities for leadership in certain moments of Australian policy in the mid 2008 to 2012 period, um, significant shifts in terms of the influence of natural catastrophes or climate catastrophes in Australia have begun to tip the balance. The, what governs the shift between factors, I won't actually go into that in any detail, but I think that both there are combinations of domestic and international forces that have come together to disrupt and, and, and overturn the predominance of purely economic and resource-driven capacities. And are we experiencing a shift now? Well, we don't know, ask me in a week's time. Um, however, despite the fact that um, this has been a very strange election campaign in the last two weeks, and this is the last week of it, and climate change has not been a prominent feature, unlike in the previous um, five or six elections, the underlying influence of climate policy on, the, on, on climate as a, as a concern on the outcome is going to be very substantial. In a number of marginal seats, these were the seats that got burnt out during the terrible Black Summer bushfires in the last um, three, three years ago. The shift in mood there, the anger at in government inaction is profound. And there are a number of inner urban seats where independent candidates standing on climate as a single issue are getting an extraordinary amount of support. So it could yet again be the case that climate determines the election outcome and perhaps now tips us into a new phase of policy development. Thanks very much. Great. Thank you so much for that also extensive and, and comprehensive discussion. Uh, I, I guess there's a, there's a few questions. Um, we don't have a huge amount of time, unfortunately. Um, I, I guess I guess I would I would like to to take a couple of, of questions ever so quickly, and then I think also ask you all about the fact that in both of these critical nations uh, for for climate mitigation, 
uh, in terms of you know energy consumption and the uh, decarbonization and energy transition. Uh, and in in Brazil, the the Amazon rainforest and the mitigation and adaptation uses of that. And uh, in uh, in Australia, important issues of adaptation and uh, biodiversity as well, both um, you know on on the continent and and the Great Barrier Reef. Um, I, I I think that you know sort of questions exist about prospects for policies because. As, as both of you or both groups of uh, presenters seem to have it conveyed, it seems that in, in some regard, both of these nations, along with others like the United States, have had swinging pendulums of polarization of climate policy and climate denial uh, mixed with efforts to actually enact policies. And it seems that in fact, we need mitigation policies and adaptation policies. And for example, in the Australian case, there's been a dramatic reduction in emissions, but owing really to economic changes in the costs of renewables rather than in any policies. So it seems, and we've seen throughout this series in part that, you know, that policies are not changing that quickly. At the international level, there has been an inability to act in a decisive manner, and that in most nations, um, European, some European nations accepted that um, there's there's been um, a relative inaction, and so the question is: Are we going to have to wait until the economics of climate change uh, takes care of us, or are these hard countries, these hard cases? Um, they, they would seemingly be good, good cases to ask about what it would take to get uh, strong climate policies. I, I, think, I think we'll finish on that and, and you know, see if, if any, any or all of you would like to respond. I mean, the questions, the other questions here are, are very specific ones about percentage loss of the world's oxygen um, in deforestation in the Amazon and another question about the role of non-state actors and subnational governments uh, in in the Brazilian case. I, I think, I guess that was depicted strongly in the uh, Australian case. Um, we only have about five minutes, but I wonder if um, if if you all might take a stab at at some of the broader questions or some of these narrow ones. Uh, who would like to to give a shot? I can. Great, all of you. Maybe, <laughs> maybe shall we go in the order of presentation? Is that okay? Yeah, of course. All right, thanks. Okay, so I would like to answer the question that's in the Q and A about um, the Amazon and oxygen. What is currently estimated to be catastrophic or have catastrophic consequences is deforestation reaching twenty five percent of the Amazon. And currently, approximately 20% of the forest has already been deforested. Um, what, it, what can be catastrophic is deforestation reaches 25% of the forest combined with the effects of climate change and um, fires. This could cause the Amazon to cross a tipping point of switching from rainforest to savanna in large parts of the region. And, if, and um, if this would be the case, large amounts of carbon would be released into the atmosphere, further exacerbating global warming. Uh, moreover, the Amazon's hydrological engine, which plays a critical role in regulating the planet's climate, would likely be modified. So contrary to what is generally thought, oxygen supply is not really a problem related to the destruction of the Amazon. The exacerbation of climate change and the modification of the planet's hydrological engine and also the loss of biodiversity are the real serious problems when it comes to, to, to the Amazon. The Amazon's net contribution to oxygen, uh, to the oxygen we, we breathe, uh, is very low or insignificant. I don't know if Eduardo wants to add something to this. No, it's not in relation to this, but I can uh, uh, talk a little bit about the, the role of non-state and subnational governments in the Amazon. 
in, in Brazil, generally speaking, because we have been mostly concentrated in Brazil, in, in the Amazon, but of course, the Amazon is a part of Brazil, it's not uh, the whole Brazil, even in terms of emission for land use change, there is another area with significant emission that it's a Cerrado Savan, okay, but the, the Amazon is much more than the Cerrado Savan. Uh, the the subnational governments, the state governments, uh, has been uh, relevant players recently during the uh, Bolsonaro administration. Uh, uh, before the, there was a, a somehow during the period of successful control of deforestation, there was com there was the national government was much more progressive than the state governments. Okay, uh, in the and in the last period uh, after neglect, the, the denier of climate change and the uh, promoting of deforestation, that this is the Bolsonaro administration. During this period, uh, the state government, most state governments in the Amazon has been uh, more progressive than the national government. I mean, it's not very difficult to, to be more progressive than the national government anyway, though there are some state governments that are as bad as the, as the national government. Uh, and so there has been formation of a coalition of uh, Amazonian governors, okay, that has tried to negotiate directly uh, in the international arena. For example, since the, sus the suspension I mean, uh, Norway and Germany suspended the donations to the Amazonian Fund, particularly no Norway was a major donor, okay? And once this happened, because of the policies of the Bolsonaro administration, the uh, governors of some Amazonian states, particularly the two more important, Para, uh, the three more important, Para, Amazonia, Amazonia and Mato Grosso have been trying to, to, to have direct funding of the Amazonian fund for the state governments. This is something that it has been considered by the uh, European governments, but they are waiting for a change of administ national administration because the policy of European governments is not to bypass the national governments. Uh, uh, generally speaking, but we can expect that in the case of re-election of Bolsonaro, that is less likely, uh, there will be a kind of uh, direct uh, support of the uh, Germany and uh, Norway and the general the European Union to the, progress, the less conservative governments in the, Ama, in the Amazonian state. There is no progressive government in the states, in the Amazonian state. Okay, there are less conservative. Uh, and as con some governors are as conservative as the federal and some others are less conservative, but there, is, there are not progressive governments. Uh, um, okay, and the, the NGOs uh, has been very important during the period of uh, the successful policy for controlling deforestation. But they have, they have suffered from a retraction of public opinion uh, in relation to environmental and climate issues, Amazonian issues, since the crisis or the economic, political, uh, and corruption crisis started in 2014. Okay, and so the, we can say that Brazil is today is something very important to consider, very different from Australia and United States. Is a society that is. Uh, the per capita income is declined, declining. So the last 10 years, now our per capita income is 13% uh, lower than in 2012. Okay, so generally all uh, political science theory uh, says in relation to this, that uh, when you have a major stagnation and reversion in economic prosperity, it's much more difficult to, to have attention of the public opinion to the environment and climate because there is much more attention to more survival issues. However, because of the dramatic uh, uh, retrogression of the, of the Bolsonaro administration policies, 
uh, there has been a revival of uh, a public opinion, uh, starting, I would say, in the end of 2019, okay, and increasing. And there are, for example, I, I belong to a coalition that is, uh, the name it was created during the 2020, that is Amazonian Concertation. We are 200 people, individuals, we, academic scientists, uh, uh, entrepreneurs, even large entrepreneurs, uh, large banks, okay? Uh, people from banks, CEOs, no? uh, and uh, uh, people from agribusiness, progressive agribusiness, and also industrial sector. And we have been discussing a lot of issues once a month, okay? And uh, we are having a very active uh, building up of a program for the next government, of course, uh, this will be significant in the case of uh, defeat of Bolsonaro, otherwise it will not be significant, okay? So I would say that uh, the, um, the condi I would say condi uh, NGOs have been revived. Uh, there has been of a renaissance of NGO uh, um, uh, uh, participation in, 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 in the public sphere in Brazil. Eh? Even in a situation of stagnation and declining of economics. Brazil is today a clearly declining country. Mm -hmm. It's not as severe as Argentina that is declining since 1970, eh? but, uh, but has been uh, uh, having a poor economic performance since 1980. I'm clearly the uh, economically decline and creating more social inequality, more uh, deterioration of the social fabric, let's say. So those are the conditions and the difficulties for the operation of, of NGOs in Brazil and civil society in general, even for, for a, a new national goal. Thank you very much. Just a couple of quick comments. That look, that that's a really fascinating overview of what's happening in Brazil. Depressing, of course. Um, in Australia, I think that, as I mentioned, I think we have a parallel problem. One is what happens in the domestic economy in relation to fossil fuels mitigation, transition, and so on. And the second is the export-oriented economy. Domestically, as I stressed, the very substantial shift in the um, cost away, away from the cost, the, the predominance of accessible, cheap fossil fuel based energy to cheap and easily accessible renewable energy has meant that the rate of mitigation, the rate of decline in the most important sectors at the moment, um, electricity generation and transport is only going to accelerate. And the economic drivers there are simply market forces, which are now being amplified by government because there's no alternative for them but to do that. And it's going along with a shift in public opinion. So in terms of the mitigation narrative in Australia, I think we are moving irrespective of which color or, 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 or ideological orientation of government we're going to have after Saturday, I think the process of mitigation, the process of emissions decline is going to accelerate in Australia until we hit the really hard problem, which is the Brazilian problem. Of what do you do with land-based emissions, which mm. in Australia still is, you know, 20% of emissions, agriculture, reforestation, all of those issues are much harder ones to grapple with. And in Australia, we don't really have any discussion of any value in that space. So the, the rush towards net zero by 2050, which I think is far too late, I think is going to stall or run into problems as a result. But in terms of that big industrial shift, I think things are going to be pushed along by this transformation market forces. In terms of export emissions, embodied emissions, um, the major parties are far too scared to go anywhere near that policy. Uh, that, that policy problem. And they're hoping, again, that internationally, the same market forces are going to resolve this crisis for them. In other words, the decline in demand in China, in India, transitions occurring in the major developing country markets will leapfrog over the development of fossil fuel demand and Australia's export markets will simply collapse. 
that'll be catastrophic domestically in terms of social outcomes, the sort of structural transition and change that needs to occur in certain parts of the country. We're very poorly prepared for that, but there's a cowardice when it comes to policy in that space. The problem is that that collapse in market by, propelled by international market forces is simply going to be too late if we're serious about, about a, a really um, timely global mitigation and holding closer to 1.5 than not. That transition market forces is far too late, so we need a volitional policy-oriented thing. And the, the implications for Australia and globally um, of the generation of significant stranded assets is really very poorly understood. And while I, I mentioned that in the Australian economy we have an inflated sense of how important the fossil fuel export sector is for the Australian economy, nevertheless, we have some very large companies, global players, based in Australia. And if they go to the wall, the disruptions domestically to the domestic economy and the global economy could be quite considerable and there are ramifications that flow through from that. So I'm much less optimistic about that part of the discussion. And that's where most of my efforts, and I think much of uh, public effort ought to go. Last quick comment in terms of public opinion and um, non-state actors. Uh, and, and I was very interested to hear Eduardo, your comments about subnational actors and how they're playing out. I think there's a whole other research project to be done looking at that. Uh, in the Australian context, and I don't know how this has played out elsewhere, but COVID really depressed, suppressed public mobilisation for obvious reasons. We had lockdowns in Australia, you know, two years of sort of people just being, high, as we still are, hiding behind our masks in our rooms with our doors closed. Despite the advances in, in, in social media, this has had a very strange effect on mobilisation around this issue. We're coming out of that, and in this election we've seen a little bit of that, but there have been no public rallies. The traditional environment groups and climate groups, I don't think are very fleet-footed when it comes to this new challenge of mobilisation. So the, the impact of COVID on democracy and specifically this issue, I think is again another very important issue for us to perhaps think about. There's, there's another seminar or book for you, Todd. <laughs> Just a question, Peter. Uh, there is it was about the pressing conjuncture. Uh, the uh, exportation of uh, fossil fuels from Australia to Europe has increased as a result of the of the war. Not yet. So there, there are some people who are hoping that with the shutting down, as I, as I think it will occur and will persist, of gas from Russia to Europe. I think, there's, I think the disruptions of the Ukrainian war are going to be long lived. And in fact, there are some benefits. Obviously, it will accelerate decarbonisation in Europe, which is a great outcome, though, with some social and economic trauma. At the moment, some in Australia are hoping that, liquid, that LNG, liquid natural gas from Australia, will be rerouted and sent off to Europe. But in fact, there are long standing contracts and obligations for what we are currently and projected to supply. So we will simply not have the capacity to compensate for that European uh, problem, at least in the short term. And I think the general expectation in terms of global energy trade is that most of that compensation will come from the United States uh, and their gas supplies. So that's probably a good thing for Australia that we don't suddenly start finding ourselves shored up by yet another geopolitical crisis. But I don't, but the prices of energy have increased and that in itself is encouraging gas producers and coal producers to think they've got more life, uh, long, a longer life than they otherwise might have. And that's, that's the implication that I was talking about in terms of geopolitical impacts. Great, well, th well thank you all. Uh, just to, to wrap up ever so quickly by, by thanking you uh, wishing uh, uh, Europe a good a good night, wishing Australia a good morning, and those of us in, in between, we're going to continue our afternoon. And just to thank all of you again, um, this, the Center for Environmental Policy was pleased to run this webinar series, and many, most, of, I dare say, all of us who have presented here are working on uh, a book manuscript that we hope to uh, have ready 
uh, in production within a few months. So stay tuned for that. And, um, and thank you all very much. Again, thanks. And um, thanks, Bob. Appreciate, and thanks, appreciate everybody's willingness to join us and for staying with us. Have a good day. Thanks. Bye, all. Bye.